Welcome, 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 listeners, to Calex at Radio Mach 2.0. We are here today the title with Matt Owen, and the title of the show today is Plurinational California. It's here because it is actually here. We are actually doing it already in uh, places like Palm Springs. Matt, what can you tell us about a plural ne- Plurinational California and where we're already doing it and what that looks like where we're already doing it? Well, uh, the idea is that uh, California and the indigenous nations of California will be recovering their sovereignty together. Okay. Uh, that sounds wonderful. A big, uh, a big part of that is returning public lands to the indigenous nations. Uh about half of California is public land, uh, federal and a few state. And returning that to them would entail them administering it jointly, just like they did Alcatraz when they occupied it under the same treaty, which gives them the rights to this land, the second treaty of Fort Laramie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, a practical example of how that would work has been in place for decades. Uh-huh. And that is when the Agua Caliente Reservation was set up, uh, the feds checkerboarded it. It's like every other parcel is the reservation. And the reason they did that originally was to be able to extract resources from that part, the, the parcels that weren't on the reservation to build the Southern Pacific Railway. Okay, it's, they didn't ask. They just did it. But... In the meantime, two cities have grown up uh, on those uh, alternate parcels. <clears throat> and indeed, uh, the Agua Caliente Reservation, they're known as Palm Springs and Cathedral City. Okay, these are not poor towns. They're doing quite well. And they have uh, natural reserves administered by the Agua Caliente Reservation. So the idea is for our California Republic to follow their example. Okay. So you would end up just like they have two plurinational cities. We would end up with the uh, plurinational republics uh, co administered by the California national government and the uh, California Indigenous Congress, modeled on uh, the, the Mexican uh, Santa E in which each sovereign nation would send a representative to this Congress and they would administer the uh, returned lands, as well as the dealings with the California national government. They would become a branch of it, like uh, our National Assembly or our uh, executive branch and judicial branch would be a branch dealing with relations between uh, the sovereign uh, Republic of California and these uh, sovereign indigenous nations. So it would be kind of a confederation almost, as it is between the cities of Palm Springs, Cathedral City, and Nahuatl Caliente Reservation. Like I say, we have a working model in place, and it works quite well. Matt, can you break that down for us and tell us exactly how that works in detail? Okay. The Agua Caliente Reservation is the largest landhold in both Palm Springs and Cathedral City, since they own half the city. They own it, it's theirs. Uh, It's considered part of those two cities, and there's, you know, a few parcels, excuse me, of the reservation that are not uh, in the cities, they're in Riverside County. But uh, basically, what that means is those two cities are co-governed both by the city government, the mayor, the city council, that sort of thing, and by the Agua Caliente General Council. Okay, so they have to work uh, quite closely together. Now, who order, ma- Matt, who makes those, up the who makes up the general council? The general council is basically all the members of the uh, sovereign nation. Okay, that's the same way it works in, in uh, all of them because there's usually quite few uh, members of these sovereign nations. And so they can meet together as a general council. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. And basically the general council (coughs) schedules meetings. And uh, if 
if you don't show up, well, you miss out. I, one of my uh, rideshare passengers uh, was going up to the casino not to gamble or to, you know, enjoy the, the buffets or nothing like uh, I'd go with the buffets. But this person was going up because they're a member of the council. And he says, yeah, uh, you know, I'm going up there <clears throat> to tell them things that they don't want to hear. And they're going to tell me things I don't want to hear. What fun, but I got to do it. <laughs> you know, so up you went. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that works like that. Now, how can we apply that here in the rest of California? And what is keeping us from it? Well, what's keeping us from it is the fact that we're still part of the United States. Most of this land that we would be returning, we can't because the feds have it. Okay, it uh, is with uh, the uh, BLM and the Forest Service and the National Park Service, and some belongs to the U.S. military. So, because we're still part of the United States at this point, we can't return it. Uh, whereas if we were... Uh, a uh, sovereign, independent uh, California Republic, we would be in the position to return it. And so it would be a new beginning for us. We would have that opportunity, that possibility of returning uh, public lands to the original owners. They're so huge, they cover half the state that they wouldn't be returned to any one specific sovereign nation. Uh, like in Alcatraz, for example, when Alcatraz was uh, occupied under the authority of the Second Treaty of Fort Laramie, uh, the uh, Native uh, Americans came from all over. Okay, the indigenous Americans came from all over. And so they set up a general council uh, of their own uh, on the island of Alcatraz to uh, administer the occupation while it was taking place. And people come and people go. Okay, uh, until finally, the way the feds dealt with it was they made it into a national park. It's no longer on use, says they, and that's the thing. As long as California is part of the United States, we can't return that land. It's federal. Right. Once we regain our sovereignty, we can turn around and help them regain theirs. Now, Matt, okay. something that made this even more clear uh, that I saw come out from Marcus just the other day was a big document with lots of pictures in it that helped to explain how this federal land really doesn't affect us in terms of where do we all live and how do we all make money, how much money can we make, and uh, it, it really doesn't affect non-native Californians at all and wouldn't affect us uh, if we gave it back. We would not lose by giving it back. We would simply gain uh, or regain the trust of our indigenous brothers and sisters because um, over this great period of time, we have completely lost that trust and messed up this mutual respect that we could have had with our indigenous brothers and sisters from the get-go when the United States just came in and took over and we came in uh, from Europe actually. We, we are not native to the United States. We are actually the invaders and the immigrants uh, that we talk about when we say, oh, we don't like immigrants, go back to Mexico, go back here, go back there. If you don't like it, go away. Um, you know, so we're the ones who it not only immigrated, but invaded and took over the land uh, and, and stole their children and treated their children, started to treat their children like little, what we called Americans. We dressed them to look like us. We cut their hair. We sent them to our schools and sent them to our churches. They had actually had their own spiritual practices and they actually already knew, uh, the, the how-to and the importance of proper servitorship of the land and including watershed techniques. Um, you want to fill in some of those gaps for me, back me up on this? Well, just to take you a little uh, further back in the history, uh, because this has to do everything to do with the history of our independence movement. Uh, after independence from Spain, because it was the conquistadors who first did that to the indigenous people, Spanish conquistadors, 
and with the recuperation of uh, the sovereignty of uh, the, the various vice royalties in the Spanish Empire, one of them was Mexico. Okay, it was the vice royalty of New Spain, and so it uh, used the uh, quasi semi indigenous name of uh, Mexico. And with the recuperation of local sovereignty came the possibility of the recuperation of indigenous sovereignty. <clears throat> the Spaniards, the Roman Catholic Church, when they built the missions in California, basically they reduced the indigenous people to serve them. They weren't slaves, they were bought and sold. That was illegal. Uh, but uh, they were serfs to, you know, serving the church at the time. And so one of the first things that the Mexican government did soon after establishing a republic in 1824, a federal republic, by the way, like that of the U.S., uh, was to secularize the church lands. Well, there were two schools of thought as to what to do with the land that uh, was uh, returned from the church in the first instance to the Mexican Republic. One was to give it back to the people that worked it. The other was to continue what the Spaniard uh, uh, government was doing and give it out as uh, political party favors. And both practices were put into place. A uh, certain uh, young guy here in California by the name of Juan Bautista Alvarado championed the cause of giving the land back. <coughs> and, uh, later, when Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana revoked Mexican federalism and tried to impose military zone commanders as governors and abolish the uh, legislatures, uh, we rose up, uh, led by Alvarado, and an interesting incident occurred when he was uh, gathering support for independence. He went north. You know, I mean, he went south, too. He went all over the place. One of the places he went was north, and he met with uh, Solano, the, uh, the uh, person who organized 1,000 troops of his uh, Suisun nation. And... Uh, Solano says to them about Alvarado, look at this guy, remember him. He's the one that's been fighting to return our land to us. And now uh, President Santa Ana is trying to do to his people what has been done for centuries to us. We're with you. Uh, turns out that the uh, Suisun troops uh, were not needed. Uh, it was very easy. Nobody wanted to defend Santa Ana in California, really. So it was very easy to establish the Republic at that point. Uh, and then negotiations were entered into that didn't reestablish Mexican federalism across the board, but did recognize Alvarado as governor elected by the Diputación, which was our legislature, and, and therefore recognized its authority something that wasn't happening in, uh, in a lot of uh, the Mexican Republic under Santa Ana. Uh, this was, uh, he was under terrific pressure because the Texians had just seceded. Uh, and they're getting ready to bring their slaves, which is why they seceded. We were completely different from that. We didn't want to be annexed by the United States. Well, 10 years later, we were. And there went the uh, project of returning the... Uh, mission lands to their original owners well we have a chance a second chance now uh at independence and at recuperating uh indigenous sovereignty okay our sovereignty and theirs side by side hand in hand uh how can we say that we are restoring sovereignty to the california republic unless their sovereignty is also respected we have a treaty obligation that we're inheriting from the feds, the second treaty of Fort Laramie, to return the land. And we intend to do that. We intend to do that. It's so huge, it's half of California. And as you mentioned, it's the half that's very sparsely populated, can be preserved effectively. It is a huge watershed. Uh, we can do that with them. They don't have to... Uh, be cut off from the rest of California. 
You know, we don't have to set up a, a, a settler state. 